Hey, what's going on? Mecha here. Welcome back to the last part of the Fire Emblem character guide for FE10. I made two of these before, one for part one and two, and then I made one for part three as well. And this is going to be the one that wraps it all up. Now, if you've been following my character guides, if you use them to decide, you know, what to do in the game, uh, first of all, let me know because I really like to know how helpful these are. Uh, but second of all, you probably finished the game by the time this came out. And more of all, um, you probably kind of decided what to use based on how characters were in previous parts. So this guide is not necessarily, you know, needed to finish a playthrough or anything. In fact, you would never need the guide to finish a playthrough generally because the game is not that difficult. But I'd like to finish what I started and I think part 4 is interesting to talk about. So I made five real tiers and a bit of a joke tier here for the Black Knight because he's not really playable, but he's the last character on the list. And uh, I divided the characters according to uh, how good they are. Now, these are not actually tiers. They're, of course, categories. This is a character guide. Uh, that means that every character on this whole list is viable. They're not in any particular order within the category. And for example, just because one of them is above the other doesn't necessarily mean that one category is better per se. In this case, for example, the good no investments category i don't think it's necessarily better than the units in here if they've been trained uh whether you prefer a unit that is good without any training or perhaps better with a lot of training is up to you but you know you got to put them in some kind of order and i decided on this one so first of all i need to talk a little bit about the structure of part four for people who haven't played the game or just because of the way i view it so part four has uh, it's kind of two sub parts in it First of all, you have six maps where your army is divided in three. So after, at the end of part three, everyone comes together and then immediately splits up again. But this time you get to choose who goes where. Some units are forced in their own routes. For example, there's one route that's called the Grim Mercenaries route that has Ike on it, as well as Titania. And then a couple of other forced characters. Each route gets a Heron, uh, Mikaya, it goes with like Skrameer and the Sala. And then uh, Tabarn goes with Alincia and Ranolf and Lucia, so that kind of uh, stuff can kind of swap around. Uh, or th those characters cannot swap around, but most characters can swap between those routes. And you can, you know, decide on where to send them. And uh, generally, I recommend sending flyers uh, to the desert routes. And other than that, just kind of doing whatever you feel like. Um, if you want a character to get a lot of XP, it might be wise to send them to the Tibarn routes, because that's where the uh, Lagoose farming map is, if you're into that. Uh, but honestly, every chapter in this part is pretty good for farming XP, so don't get too hung up on that. Uh, every map on these in this part, except for 4-5, which is that uh, Izuka map that I just talked about, is a route map, so a very good opportunity to train units for the end game, which comes after. And then the end game is five maps in the Tower of Guidance. You can only pick 10 units alongside a couple of force units like Ike, and Mikaya, Sanaki, and uh, you get to choose which 10 you bring. And you also get to bring one of the three Herons to the tower. And you have five more maps to clear. Uh, the first one is Route and the other one is Route Kill Boss. So that's kind of the structure of part four. And it's way different from what we're used to with characters just kind of coming and leaving all over the place. And instead, you have access to most of your army for a couple maps. And then you have access to 10, but you can pick anyone from, the, from your team. So this is a guide to help you decide who to use on what routes and who to use in the Tower of Guidance, basically. And again, you can pick anyone you want. These are the ones, these are the ones that make the game the easiest, but these are the ones that might be the, make the game most, most fun. And sometimes they might overlap. Sometimes a unit it can be both fun and a really good pick. Uh, with that out of the way, I think we should just get into the no-brainers, right? So, um, Jill and to a lesser extent Har are odd ones out in this uh, tier. Normally, I just put units here that I think are always trained or basically come really good at base, like the Lagoos Royals or the Herons. Uh, but Jill, she's a unit you have to train from tier 1 in the Dom Brigade, but because she is so, 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 so good in part 4, I think she and Har deserve to be in this category, because they're the only units that, have, that fly and have one to range, I believe. I mean, there's the there's the Falcon Knights, the, the Seraph Knights, uh, but they have they don't have forged hand axes and they don't have the stats, the bulk, that uh, Jill and especially Har do. By the time you get to part 4, you also have access to much more bonus experiences, especially big in hard mode, which I'm mostly basing this on. For normal mode and easy mode, things might shift a little bit for the most part. Units that are good in hard are also good in easy, uh, but maybe not vice versa, you know? Uh, Jill, for example, is much better on normal. Uh, I just finished a playthrough, like I said, I played on hard mode, and my Jill was not tier 3 until, like, I was halfway through for prologue, I believe. But she's still very valuable because, as I said, all the maps are routes until the Tower of Guidance and there's another route map in there. And having a high move unit that can kill people at once or range is still valuable. 
even if her offense is not perfect, even if she's not actually one running everything, it's still better than just trudging along. She and Har are especially effective on the Mikaya route because that has a desert and also has a map with a couple forests in there. She can also work on the other routes just fine, but I would recommend sending them to, uh, to Mikaya's route if you train them. It really makes the maps a lot less painful. Uh, then we have Nyla. I might as well talk about Royal Lagoos in general. So Nyla goes with Ike, uh, Tabarn is with Tabarn, and uh, there you got Na who's the last one? Uh, Nasala, who is with Mikaya. Uh, there are a lot of Goose Royals that, you know, you have access to before endgame. They're all really good. They're all really high mobility units that destroy everything and you have no regard for durability whatsoever. They're basically gods. They're there to make sure that you can complete the game, even if your units are either terribly RNG screwed or you just haven't trained up the right ones. I don't know, maybe you sold out the game with Tormod or something or the Black Knight, I don't know. Either way, they're there to make sure that anyone can beat the game. I think they're a ton of fun to use. Some people think they're a bit cheap, but I think if you want to route part formats reasonably quickly and have a good time, you want to use some of the Goose Royals. And even in endgame, I would recommend anyone bring like one or two to the tower. You don't need a full army of them. It is optimal to do that, but you don't have to be optimal. But I do think it's really fun to bring a couple, just because they have a great unit feel, I guess is what I'm saying. They just It feels really good to destroy everything. Hello, that's a text message. But I don't really care. Uh, Alright. So... Uh, with that said, Nyla is with the Ike group, and Ike's group it has like a, a kind of an open field in Fog of War, where Nyla's just pretty good killing things, like that's all that there is to say. And then uh, the 4-4 uh, is the Oliver mention, where you go inside and you have to fight a bunch of bulky generals. And if you don't kill them soon enough, and you don't route the map soon enough, you're going to face a bunch of reinforcements. So Nyla is very helpful in making the map less tedious. And she's, I think, like the only character you have besides like Ike or maybe someone with a hammer that can reasonably one-shot or two-hit KO, one-round KO the generals so I can't I, would, I cannot stress enough how helpful she is here and then for endgame she's still pretty good she's a royal uh, the only real drawback to the Laguz royals is their lack of one to range uh, for Nyla this is not a big deal because most of the enemies she fights are one range but I've definitely been in spots where I'd rather have Ike or someone else with one to range fight a bunch of enemies rather than Nyla because Nyla just doesn't counter like snipers or tomahawks or crossbows stuff like that so definitely try to use her one range to the best you can put her in like groups of enemies that have one range only and uh, make someone else take care of the two range, like Ike. That's basically the way to do it. Uh, same kind of goes for the other Goose Royals. Then you have the Hurons. Uh, like I said, I think they get divided over routes. Uh, Raphael goes with uh, Micaiah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, sounds good. No, that's Leanne. Uh, Raphael goes with Ike. There you go. I Raphael goes with Ike. Gotta recruit Oliver somehow. Leanne goes with Micaiah, and Rayson goes with Tabarn. So they all have their pros and cons. I discussed them in the last few guys, so I'm not going to go over it in depth. But they're all obviously very helpful. You should use them. For the Tower of Guidance, you only get to pick one of them, unfortunately. Uh, I recommend Raphael for anyone, because for most of those maps, turn one is the most crucial one, and he's the only hero that can vigor four people on turn one. If you're taking your time, you might prefer Raisin because he can transform on turn 1 with a Lagoose Gem or a Lagoose Stone, stay transformed for practically the whole map, and he has more mobility and Kanto, and that can be more useful if you think uh, you need to. But my recommendation is Raphael. Leanne, I generally don't recommend for endgame, but it's not like you're going to have a bad time. She can only four, figure 4 people. I feel like if you bring Leanne, there's always going to be a better option than that. Uh, but if you like Leanne, go ahead and bring her. Pre the tower though, before the tower, always use your Herons. Uh, make sure to keep them out of enemy range. There's no ambush spawns, uh, but definitely highlight enemy ranges if you can on normal easy, or if you're playing on hard with the patch that I did for my Let's Play, because they still die quite easily. But yeah, Herons good. Uh, we have Har. Har specs the same as Jill, but I don't think it's pretty... Like, who plays Radiant Dawn without using Har? Like, you can do it, but you, you have to do it intentionally. Like, you have to tell yourself, I'm not going to use Har because I don't want to, because... The game is begging you to use Har, and this is just another part where it is. It's the same process, Jill. A little slower, but like I said, part 4 is more bonus experience around, so getting a speed up to par when he's kept a couple of other stats is pretty easy. Uh, the big problem with Har that I found, and kind of to Jill as well, is sleep stabs sometimes. You can't put to sleep if he's brought to like Ike's map, for example. So bring pure water, bring restore, uh, because you can't shove him to wake him up. <laughs> That's Har's like only weakness, really, in part 4. Uh, Ike, another unit that is technically not someone you can just use 
without any training, but he basically trains himself. He has forever and a half to get to level 20 in part 3. Then he promotes right at the start of part 4, and the game basically says, hey, give this guy Paragon, because you have Paragons lying around. You have one from Joffrey, one from Astrid, uh, the one from the Dawn Brigade. Give him one of those and watch him level up fast, because his stats are really good. He still has the Ragnell, which is infinite uses, 1 to 2 range, plus 5 defense. No reason not to just wipe everything off the face of the planet. Sometimes he might not double straight away. Uh, maybe magic can do a little bit of a number on him. Maybe a sleep staff. But other than that, he's pretty much invulnerable and he's going to kill everything. Uh, given enough time and... Uh, well, basically, given enough, uh, given enough attention. And he's really one of the most satisfying units to use. Because he levels up so fast with Paragon in Part 4. It's really fun to go all out with Ike. He is another one of these units that can potentially two-shot generals depending on the mode and what weapon you use. With Ragnar, it might be tough, but with the hammer, you can definitely do it. Uh, this is, I think, this is mostly helpful in endgame rather than in 4-4, uh, where it might be hard to hit those benchmarks. But like I said, having two range on a character that is so strong is exceptional. The other Goose Royals don't have that. So if you see like a group of, I don't know, Spear Halberdiers or Tomahawk Warriors or Crossbows, send Ike at them because he's the best at dealing with them. Titania, also unit you uh, need to train if you want to use her. You're not going to like deploy a base level Titania for Ike's route, but she is forced on Ike's route, and she's pretty good there. The first map is, like I said, an open field fog of war where she does pretty well. I don't think she has very good fog of war vision, but enemies can come at her and kill themselves on her. I found it that Titania sometimes doesn't double in part 4. She might need the speed wing or some Bex level ups which you might have lying around, you might not. If you don't, then she might take a couple of extra turns. Uh, for endgame, uh, Ike is forced, which is great, Titania is not. And I use a common trick with, with Titania that might hurt her in part 4 if you use it too. Um, where I give her Savior and I support her with someone like Mist or... Uh, in this case, I did like Braum with a water affinity to boost her attack and defense without actually having to like keep someone up with her. Because look... The only unit that has like similar movement to Titania in part 3 is Oscar. Like, Har is way more mobile than she is. Especially in like a map with a swamp like 3-7. So, it's pretty hard to keep up with Titania there. And in part 4, like for the pre-end game maps, it's pretty easy to just keep doing that. But for end game, you don't really want to use two slots just to bring Titania at full power. So either you ditch Titania or you ditch your support partner. Both of those are pretty bad for her, obviously. So keep that in mind if you use that trick. That's something I encountered. Um, if you didn't, if you're Titania self-sustaining, which with Soul she might just be, then no problem. But keep it in mind. Uh, we got a Heron. I got the Flying Lo Royal Lagoos. Not much to say about them. They didn't already say about Nyla. But they are really strong. Nasala only starts with S rank strike. Uh, the others all start with SS, so his might is a little bit lower. As a result, he might miss some two shot thresholds. Uh, I discussed it with Don Don a while ago. I think he said that he usually two shots like Paladins and Warriors, which is pretty important for the chapters that he's in uh, Micaiah's Forest chapter and Desert chapter. Um, Wyvern Lords, he might not two shot. That can be a bit of a problem, but generally I think he gets done what he needs to get done. Obviously, watch out for crossbows. Those will, I think, usually one-shot him, or if not, they can pretty close. Uh, this is a similar problem for Tabarn. So, Nasala and Tabarn are not necessarily the fastest solution to a bunch of enemies that have one to range. You might be better off with someone who two round KOs them, but has one to range. So even if you're Jill or Har, do not double or have the strength of two at KO. Um, respectively, basically. Um, Maybe still better than having uh, having one of the Royal Lagoos send at them, especially when they're bow users. They don't really like those very much. Uh, but if Nasala hits SS Strike, he should probably two shot things anyway. Uh, take some effort. Uh, remember that if he procs tear early or if he has adept, those extra hits don't count. Um, extra hits from adept don't count. Tear if he procs it on the first hit means one less attack. Uh, similar problem for Janaf and Oki, which we'll get into later. Uh, but yeah, these guys, these two are ridiculous. Use them at every chance you have them. Just uh, don't watch out for the two range, basically. Uh, Kanikans and Gifka are kind of like Nyla, but much stronger versions, and they're only available in endgame. Uh, if I had to tell you whether to bring them or not, I would also always tell you to bring them. I only brought Kanigas for my run to make it interesting, but they're obviously both like huge game breakers. Their attack is, I think, the highest in the game. Uh, their speed is enough to double most things. Uh, with a bit of like luck with bonus experience or speed wings or something, they can even double some of the fastest enemies in endgame, and that can really make them very powerful. Great users of Nihil and Parody there. I cannot recommend these enough, but again, not everyone wants to bring Royals to endgame, so I get it. But they're really good. <laughs> you should bring them if you never tried them out. Uh, I'm a proponent that you should try out every unit in Fire Emblem at least once. And uh, I, 
missing these would be a big shame. Uh, but there, there's not a whole lot to say about them. They just have a lot of attack, like enemies that don't get 2 hit killed by some things, like generals, uh, red dragons, um, certain bosses. You might just get 2 shot by these guys, depending on circumstances. It's pretty good. So that's no-brainer. That's the best units you can possibly ask for. Now we'll get into some more, slightly more sketchy stuff. Um, good no investments. This is a pretty small category, uh, but it's units that function in part 4 without any training, but they're not quite no-brainers. They're just really good. Uh, you could argue they belong up here with no-brainers because there's really no reason not to use them, but I do think they're like a bit below the actual no-brainers here. So Janaf and Oki are very similar. I talked about them before in part 3. They're still really good in part 4, even with no investments. Now, that doesn't mean you don't want to invest into them, because if you do, they, they will pay off big time in part 4. And there's a lot of ways you can invest into them. Energy drop is plus 2 strength without transformed, so that means that when they transform, they double their strength, and it actually becomes 4 strength. So that can let them hit 2 hit kill thresholds, and because they're so fast, they always double, so it's basically 8 extra damage. So that's a pretty big return on your investment. Alternatively, you give them Adept, uh, that means that stuff that they 2-shot, they want to have 2 shots at Adepting. Or rather, 2-shotting, they do that fine, right? But then if they 3-shot an enemy, but they proc Adept, uh, they will usually 1-run kill. And that's pretty good. Uh, pretty high chance to 1-run kill, is basically what I'm trying to say in a very complicated way. Uh, but do keep in mind, if you do this in part 3 with Adept, uh, you might miss out on some... Um, Weapon XP, because Strike Rank is pretty important for these two. They start with A-Strike, they want to hit S-Strike for another, I think, 5 points of Might, which again, can push them into 2 kill territory. Uh, another way to let them kill enemies that they normally would not is Tear, which means leveling up to level 30, and then giving them one of the many Satori signs you get. Um, again, this can cut into your opening XP a bit, but when it comes to part 4, maybe you've already got S-Strike, at that point it's probably worth it to give him that, uh, just for that extra overkill savagery. So, definitely recommend it. Uh, other than that, they're basically flying Royal Lagoos with a gauge, if that makes any sense. Like, they're basically just flying to Barnes, uh, Nylas, whatever, if they're strong enough, and very helpful. But even at base level with no investments, I recommend deploying these, giving them like, some grass, a Lagoose Stone, maybe a Lagoose Gem. There's a funny trick you can do uh, where you find a Lagoose gem in uh, one of the earlier maps uh, with a unit with a full inventory, put it in a convoy, and you can take it out with one of these two and use it to stay transformed in a map where they're not really supposed to have a Lagoose gem. Uh, I used it in like 4 4 or 4 5, I think. It's pretty good. Then we have Skrimir. Uh, he's also a pretty good Lagoose. He's not as strong as, you know, his uncle, but he's pretty damn powerful anyway. His, like, his strength is huge, his HP is big, uh, his gauge doesn't run out very fast because he's a lion, so using a Lagoose stone on him is uh, pretty safe. And then from there he just needs to grass every once in a while. Still would not recommend using against 1-2 range enemies for obvious reasons. And also his speed is a little suspect, he might not double things like warriors. So that is important to keep in mind. But he can like 1v1 a warrior pretty fine, as long as you don't like run off to heal or something. So pretty helpful in the desert because he's full movement there. And I think he also doubles paladins in hard mode, but don't quote me on that. Uh, either way, pretty good. I would not recommend bringing him to endgame because, I mean, you basically have better versions of him. Uh, but if you do bring him to endgame, you'll actually be surprised at how good he can be at fighting. But this is mostly a recommendation for these three to be brought to the pre-endgame maps rather than the endgame maps. They can work in endgame but they're not the best candidates because the Royals exist. Next up is good investments. So here I put all the units that you could have been training on previously before part four, and this is where it pays off. So you'll see both units that in like previously are pretty good and you just kind of use them, they go along with the curve, but you're also seeing units like uh, like Edward and Alincia and Nephany and Rolf and Boyd, units that are not necessarily good when they are around in their own parts. Well, Alincia is, but you can't really train her very much. Uh, but that you know, payoff in part four, depending on how much they've received. Now, I can't stress enough that some of these are better than others. I didn't put them in any particular order besides availability. So keep that in mind. But here, I'm just assuming you got them to a reasonable level at the end of part three, and now they're in part four, and you want to use them, and you want to maybe bring them to end game. That's how they're rated here. So I'm not saying all these are equal by any means, because some of these are a lot more work to train than others. But this is just to show when it pays off, basically. And I will talk a little bit about like how much it pays off for each. So Eddie, uh, he's probably not going to be quite a true blade by part four if you're playing hard mode, depending on how many characters you're using and how much XP you invested into him, like whether you gave him Paragon or Beast Foe or something like that in part three. Usually, I find my Dom Brigade members are quite unleveled, and Eddie and also Nolan and uh, any other Dom Brigade member you see here kind of suffer from that. 
Uh, but if you get him in part 4, he'll probably kind of have caught up to Zyhark because his growths are better. Uh, Zyhark is still like a tier ahead, so he's less resource intensive. But for all intents and purposes, Edward is at his best as he will be in this part of the game now. It's been a while since I've done this, but you know it will work out. His stats might be green, you can use some bonus experience. This is pretty good. Then True Blade means you have Astra, you might, have to, you might be able to give him Adept. Uh, he might still have Wrath on him. You can go kick some butt, and that can be pretty fun. And uh, this is, again, the best part in the game for him. Besides maybe like the very early part one chapters. Uh, Nolan is pretty easy to write the difficulty curve with. Mine was very, very strength screwed and he still worked okay, <laughs> okay-ish in part four and end game. Wouldn't recommend getting your Nolan with 17 strength in part three at the end of it, but here we are. And uh, he can kind of work out. He might still have the Tarvos. So you might want to hammer in it if you used it a lot in part three. Mine was nearly broken and I didn't end up hammering it, but I did end up blessing it in the tower. Uh, if you're not familiar, in part uh, 4 in the tower, uh, about halfway through, um, your weapons get blessed and that means that whatever your best weapon is, you equip it and then uh, it gets blessed by uh, spoilers, I guess. Uh, I'm not going to like, sp I'm not, I'm not going to go out of my way to say spoilers, but I'm also not going to go out of my way to avoid them completely. If that makes any sense. Uh, basically, your weapon gets blessed, it gets infinite uses from there and it's capable of harming certain bosses and the Tarvos is a pretty good candidate for that. So trying to keep it not broken is uh, pretty nice for Nolan if you bring him to endgame. Um, other than that, he just kind of goes along for the ride. He doesn't have a mount, but he does have one to range, and that means he can use like forced hand axes and kill enemies, you know, without uh, getting countered. And also he counters enemy snipers, tomahawks, you know, it works. That's pretty valuable. Volug, uh, you might expect him to be like up here because, I mean, the other Lagoos are here. The thing with Volug though is I do think he benefits a lot from investments, so I'd rather put him here to indicate that. I think a base level Volug, not very good in part 4, with no level ups, no strike rank gained. Uh, but if you've used him a lot, then he might have gotten a couple level ups that help him double attack. And more importantly, you can hit SS strike, like double S in part 4. Uh, which most regular Lagoos, like Tanaf and Oki, generally don't reach that. But Volug has a lot of time to do it. And he also doubles almost everything. So he's probably capable of reaching double S. I think mine did at some point, maybe within part 4, maybe a little bit before that. But he definitely was able to. And that's good, because that's a massive amount of might. I think it's 14 might or something, damn. It's it's a lot. Might even be more than that. Either way, it's pretty impressive. Uh, same issues as, like, Skrimir, obviously, where, you know, no flight, and uh, still the goose gauge to worry about, still no two range. Uh, but pretty nice to have around. Uh, similar, to them, similar to them, though, I wouldn't bring him to endgame, unless you just really like him. Zhark, Zyhark, however you pronounce it. Uh, similar story to Eddie. I... Find it in part 3, he's not really all that good, because relying on dodging is pretty hard when you're facing Lagoos with high hit rates, and then you're facing Ike and his 3 leadership stars, but, you know, if you made it to part 4, he'll probably be fine. I uh, just gotta give him a couple bonus experience levels, probably. Uh, definitely get him to tier 3 ASAP, because in tier 2, part, like, in part 4, you tend to die pretty quickly as a tier 2 unit. It's not very satisfying. Just get him to tier 3 ASAP, maybe use a Master Crown, or uh, preferably back spin up, because the last couple levels he'll probably get good stats like strength that he needs, since he's probably capped skill and speed. Uh, but yeah, a little bit of babying and he'll be good. Alincia is interesting to train because, like I said, she's actually good pre-part 4, but she's just not around in part 3 at all, and that's a big uh, oof for her, you know, capabilities of training and, you know, having utility. Uh, but when you get her in part 4, a couple things happen. Uh, for one, she has the mercy skill, so <laughs> take that off her, because otherwise she can't kill anything. She'll just leave enemies at 1 HP. I've seen a poor soul uh, have Alincia in part 4 and uh, put Paragon on her, but forget to take off mercy and that not very good results. So Lincia at base in part 4, or with like 1 or 2 levels under her belt, is probably not doubling or quadding enemies with the Amidi. Um, in the case of the Amidi, she's not quadding, and that's a little sad, because that means that it's much harder to feed kills to her, because she's also not two-shotting things. So what you want to do is probably Bexper a couple times. Uh, her strength and speed growth are all really good, same with her skill growth. I think her even her HP growth is decent, I don't know about her defense. But the point is, Bex levels will probably get her decent stats uh, to the point where she might be able to like, get to quadding soon. Her growths are just good enough to that where if you do it a couple times, she'll level up well and you can kind of, you know, turn her into an endgame worthy unit. But without any training, she's not going to be that good. Uh, still, staff utility without training is nice, so you could, you know, put her up here. But um, I think generally, Ilencia's combat is worth highlighting as good. And uh, even if not, you know, she's a flyer with a staff rank and that alone is pretty helpful. So, even if you're not training her, I recommend making use of her in pre-part 4. 
Nephany, um, combat unit that you gotta train. Uh, don't really have much to say about her that happened already during part 3 and 2. Um, she's around quite a bit, so you have lots of opportunities to train her, but obviously it does take investments. Uh, pretty good end result though. I like that she has a pretty good endgame weapon in the Wishblade, which has 1 to range and pretty good stats overall. And I like that she has 1 to range in general. I like that she has... I mean, I don't like not having a mount or anything, uh, but at least being on foot isn't that terrible in most part 4 maps. I like that she's fast enough to double things. Yeah, that's that's Nephany for you. Uh, Rolf, uh, just like Eddie, huge investment project, but this is when it pays off. Uh, he also gets a really good endgame weapon, the double bow. Uh, it's a really good bow that you receive somewhere during part one, the first part of endgame. It's on an enemy sniper. It's a 1-2 to two range bow, so it fixes all of a sniper's problems. And in addition, uh, Rolf is probably a marksman by then, which means he has 3 range. So you get someone that has 1-3. to three. Uh, I said it's a pretty big deal to have 1-2. 1-3 to to is even cooler. Uh, it gives you a lot more flexibility in where you position yourself. It makes it easier to use, for example, the tides with the dragons. Uh, with like Enna and uh, Kurtnaga and stuff like that. Uh, it also means that you can just attack things without being in the way of others. And you don't even have to protect them anymore because the double bow is just that good. I mean, one to two range, what more could you ask for? Pretty damn strong. Um, it still kind of sucks that before he gets a double bow, he doesn't count on enemy phase. Unless you put him like in a very specific position. Most enemies have at least one, to one range or one to two range. So making them suicide into Rolf can be a little bit tricky. So he still has a bit of an issue. Same with Shinan actually. Uh, but for endgame, I still felt like it was worth putting him up there. Like, this was my one opportunity to put Rolf in a high tier. Uh, high category. So, yeah. Uh, Boyd also kind of goes nuts in part 4. Probably his best part. He has a bit of a rough start. His strength isn't like exactly the best as good as you'd hope it to be. And his speed is absolutely awful. If you can get him to double in part 4, he's going to have really high attack and be one of the few units who can actually two-shot generals. I believe for some efficient playthroughs, some of them actually train up Boyd. Maybe transfers Boyd try and make sure that he can two-shot generals with forged hand axes. That is obviously busted. But again, investment project. If you do it, he's going to be really good. And also good for endgame. Pretty good stats overall. Uh, but takes a lot of, takes a lot of work. Oscar, uh, it was pretty good in base in part 3. Uh, part 4, I don't think it's a strong point, but he can probably do just fine by, uh, you know, just finding things. I don't remember particularly how great my Oscar was, if it was in like, blessed or not. Uh, you could argue that maybe you should belong utility filler because his stats aren't great long term, his caps aren't very high. Uh, but I don't think he's like as bad at combat as some of these, so kind of a tough time designing where the Oscar wins, but decided to go with here. Uh, I don't think he's forced on Ike's route, but I would recommend sending him there anyway. He probably has a support partner there, depending on what you did with your other units. And honestly, this is the route that they works out the best anyway, because uh, that horse, that the <laughs> that horse of his is the least impeded by that route. Like Makai has a desert, Tabarn has a swamp and a bunch of forests. Relatively speaking, uh, horses are best off on Ike's route. I don't know if you could hear, but there was like a huge car coming by. <laughs> uh, let's get to Gatri. So. Uh, very strong armored guy with thick strength defense speed probably too considering how good his growth is so if he gets to the enemy they're probably dead and he will come out alive and that's a pretty good result for part four where you have to fight a lot of enemies at once uh, access to forge hand axes and javelins if you shoot one it's generally you don't because hand axes are just better all around every way possible they're cheaper stronger more accurate and uh, there's no weapon triangle in hard mode unless you're playing with the patch that I did so no reason not to use hand axes on him so even though it says Lens General on his tier 2 class, don't worry about it. Just use hand axes to kill everything. Mia, really easy unit to use in part 3. Scales pretty well into part 4. Uh, doubling Sword Masters is something she can do that very few other people do. So that is a nice niche that she has. I, I always forget how to pronounce that word. I hope I said it right. Um, having access to a forged sword might be nice for her because her attack can be suspect sometimes because the low miter swords. Uh, her strength stat is actually pretty good because bonus experience is works pretty well for her, uh, despite the lack of bonus experience in hard mode sometimes. I think Mia is one of the few characters who has a low enough level to where it can kind of work and needs few enough of it for it to work. Like, she's also like really good at combat even with bonus, without bonus experience, so she's not relying on it uh, like someone like Eren is, for example. They have Tanith, and I put her here because I think flyers are just really good in general, but she is getting carried pretty hard by that class because her stats are not super great. But they can work out to a point where I think she's worth investing in for part 4, if you're inclined to do so. It's pretty hard to justify doing it sometimes, considering the alternatives you have. Uh, but overall, 
If you prefer, you can have her like just as utility by just fly dropping people around a desert or something. I do that all the time. Uh, but I think Tanith is long-term viable, so I put her in here. I don't actually know a whole lot about her because it's been a while since I used her in hard mode. Uh, I just remember being kind of a pain in the ass in the start of at the end of part three. Uh, but in part four, it can probably work out for you. So I might be wrong on that. Next, we have utility. These are units that have some kind of utility, as it says, or filler. Basically, means uh, they can use stabs, they can rescue drop someone. Uh, they are pretty good, but not super great at combat at base. So they might be potential endgame candidates or they can kind of kill a couple of enemies in a route map somewhere, but they're not super great at it. That's basically the description of every unit in this tier. So I'm gonna go by them fairly quickly because it's somewhat obvious, and uh, I talked about what these units do previously uh, before part four already. So it's kind of repetitive to go over each and every one of them in very great detail. So Mikaya, at this point, she still hasn't promoted, which is very annoying. So staff utility is mostly what she can do, uh, just like in part three. Her range might not be too great if you haven't trained her, but something like Restore or Physic, you almost always find some kind of use for it. So it's pretty nice. Uh, just very fragile and a game over condition, so you <laughs> gotta be very careful with her if you're Iron Manning or um, you just don't want to reset a long part format. Uh, I like to equip the Restore Staff in the Desert because it means that if she gets silenced, she just instantly restores herself. Pretty neat trick she can do. And then Restoring Others is also just a breeze. Uh, she has full movement in the Desert too, which is kind of nice. And then maybe sometimes she can chip something, but I find that the magic damage is pretty lacking. Like you try to kill a Paladin, or a general in endgame with uh, the Thaney and just end up very disappointed. So don't bother with combat generally. Uh, she's forced to endgame though, so free utility there. Leonardo, I've said in previous guides, I actually kind of prefer using Leonardo as a, not really as a training project, but just as a utility sniper. Uh, so as Archer, just hitting people with crossbows, ballistas, that kind of stuff can be pretty helpful by itself. Uh, picking off like a Falcon Knight somewhere might be all he does. Uh, that is pretty much all he does though. If you wanted to make him like good at combat, I put him around here in high effort. Uh, but as is, I felt like I liked him enough for utility. Uh, making use of his water support might also be tough in the enemy in the high enemy density maps that part four offers. So that's also annoying. Laura, uh, similar story to Micaiah really. Uh, staff, grinding, physicking, that kind of stuff. Pretty self-explanatory. Soth also doesn't promote right away in part 4, he promotes before the second part, uh, before the second portion of part 4. Um, Kai promotes for endgame by the way, but doesn't really do a whole lot besides just a flat increase in stats. Uh, but Soth doesn't promote until the desert chapter. In the desert he can find items, which is actually pretty helpful, because he can do it uh, at a higher chance than other units. He still has not full move with the desert, he has like 3 or 4 move I think. So I like to carry me around with like Sigrun, Tanith, uh, Niluchi. Uh, Nisala if I really have to, so uh, you might want to do that for Soth to speed it up. Not very good at combat, I think he like two or three rounds enemies, including the fact that he doubles. He gets Bane as a mastery, which I still have to try out if it can actually proc, if he would kill otherwise, but either way it's a pretty bad mastery compared to the others, because the others are just Okos, and his cap's also not very good. He is forced to end game, but I recommend against deploying him, because he just doesn't do very much damage, and if an enemy can choose between attacking Soth and attacking someone who actually kills them, he'll probably go for Soth, and then he's basically being a liability. That's why I don't like Soth. And I use him a lot. <laughs> I use him a lot in part 1, and I use him some in part 3, and he still doesn't end up great. So I recommend not investing in Soth, I recommend using him whenever you feel like he's helpful in the early parts, like I said. And then in part 4, I recommend just not using him for combat at all, unless you have no alternative. Chironio, kind of a similar story, like really good in part 1, and still pretty good in part 3. Part 4 is not a shining moment, he can still help, I think he's stronger than Soth, his stats are much higher. Uh, particularly bulk and just raw might is higher. Speed I think is his biggest issue, uh, but if you want to you can throw him a Master Crown if you haven't already, promote him and have him pick off an enemy here or there in a couple maps. Uh, not ideal, but he can work. Uh, Marcia, mostly here for flying. You could have invested into her, in that case she might be like somewhere closer to Tanith, but I feel like Tanith is easier to invest into and make good, uh, whereas Marcia is really more of a utility flyer overall. But if you invest into her, obviously she goes here. Uh, Niluchi, Really hard to invest into considering his low XP gains, so really just a utility flyer. Uh, Lucia, similar story to like Toronio, um, can be a helpful emergency router. Uh, for example, in the first Tabar map, uh, you might deploy her, keep her at the starting point, and a couple warriors pop up. She can kind of fight those, but on her own, she usually gets her butt kicked, so she might need some backup because she's definitely not as good as she was back in part two. Uh, it kind of sucks that she's not available in this game at all, basically. Also not a great, like, none of these are great endgame candidates unless they're forced. I thought, that was pretty much obvious, I thought, but uh, that's what I'm saying here. 
Uh, but yeah, she's forced into barn route. Uh, Kieran, I think, is also forced into barn route. He's kind of okay. I used him in a draft race, but that's on easy mode. I think on hard mode, he's significantly worse. But you can still pick off enemies in emergency. He's not as bad as the others. And you might have given him Paragon for part 3, uh, which really means part 3-9. If you used him full-time, again, maybe he goes here, but... The Paladin class in this game is not exactly known for its late endgame potential, and uh, Kieran is part of the reason they have that reputation. Uh, Reese, staff utility, uh, pretty good staff utility because his range is much better than Micaiah's, Aurora's, or Mist's, so uh, probably the best staff user besides Alencia. So wouldn't mind against deploying him. Gotta keep him out of combat because he's very fragile, but other than that, he works pretty well. Uh, Renolf, similar story to Kieran and Lucia, even forced on the same routes. You know, Cat Lagoos. Isn't ideal, but his stats are pretty nice, and uh, you might have used him like a couple times in part 3 already. Probably won't be S strike unless you trained him a lot, in which case, you know, investments. But uh, generally I think it works best as utility. Sigrun, uh, fly utility, you could make her tier 3 if you wanted to, she's like one level away, two levels away if you use Bex, one level away if you use a Master Crown instead. So that could be worth, uh, her stats won't be good either way. Uh, but she could, if you really try to, you could probably make her good. That'd be more of a high effort thing. I usually just like her to just rescue job people around in the desert. Sanaki, uh, she joins for free in uh, Micaiah's chapters. Uh, she's like Micaiah, except no staves and much higher magic. So basically, she's like she's not like Micaiah at all, uh, unless she trained Micaiah a lot. Uh, her her attack power is really high, not high enough to the point where she one shots, but high enough to where any, almost anyone can finish off an enemy that she weakens with Simbling, which is her personal tome. Uh, she can also use Rex Flame in that game if you get like I think she has SS um, fire tomes at base. If not, you can probably get it with the plenty of arm scrolls that you can get in this game. Rex Flame gives plus three speed. It also weighs her down, so you have to get her strength up before it actually, you know, is a benefit to her. Generally, I think you're best off not doing that. That's kind of a high effort thing. Generally, I think you're best off just, uh, you know, using Cymbeline to chip people. Uh, like, like all mage classes, she has high move in the desert, and by high, I mean more than everyone else. It's still only like five or six. Uh, but that can be helpful when escaping danger or approaching an enemy before they can approach you, because, like, let's say there's a Wyvern Lord that's, like, not in a spot where Masanaki can reach, but in a spot where you can reach Sanaki next turn, that's big trouble. So you better be able to maneuver your way out of that. Uh, similar story with Laura and Mikai. You don't want Wyverns to come near these units. So Sanaki can be part of a group that makes sure that these enemies, if they come near, can get killed before they can cause a game over or reset. Or both. Okay, now we get a couple units that join during part four and are actually like not bad at combat or utility at all, but they're not as good as like trained units. So Stefan, like Sanaki is kind of like that. Stefan is much like that. Um, I, I, I was talking to Razes about this a while ago, and I was like, you know what, compared to the other units, Stefan's probably not worth, because he's a pretty good, like, true blade at base, but he's not going to compare to a support and trained um, Mia, for example. But if you compare him to the enemies that you face in endgame, he's probably better than that, so that's kind of how I weigh Stefan. He's not great, uh, but he's probably worth recruiting for the Vate Kadi alone, and uh, this base convo afterwards is also pretty funny, so I do recommend uh, picking him up, but training him... It's not really something you can do because he joins basically right before endgame when you think about it. And he doesn't, he's not super impressive in endgame, but he can work all right. Um, swords are nice, but he doesn't two shot generals. He needs to like proc Astra and maybe get some crits. And then um, he needs Alon Dice for one to range, which can work, I guess. Eh, he could work. Uh, Oliver, staff utility, really good staff utility. Actually, I brought him to endgame for memes, obviously. Um, if you don't know, you can recruit him with Raphael in 4 4. Uh, just put Raphael on his range and run up to him and be like, oh my god, it's a Heron, and just join you. That is helpful. Uh, he has A rank staves, so you can get into S rank or even double S with arm scrolls if you want to, or just spam staves a lot, you can get him there as well. And his magic is pretty impressive, and there's a lot of staff utility in the game, like rescue, physic, fortify, uh, matrona if you wanted to, uh, to manipulate biorhythm and just heal someone. There's a lot of stuff that staff user can just do. I was surprised at how useful he was. Even Purge occasionally has been helpful. And you can use all that at base or with a couple of arm scrolls. So I actually like Oliver a lot. Just obviously don't fight with him because his base speed is absolute trash. I think it's like 14 or something. He gets doubled by literally everything. Uh, but if you keep him out of combat or just use Purge or Stabs, works pretty fine. Bastion, similar story. Not... I think his base staff rank is like A or something. I think it's slightly lower than Oliver's maybe. Uh, but either way, it works out fine. Um, he has effectiveness against multiple goose in his joining map, uh, four five. I don't count that for much, but I've gotten use out of Meteor before on him, for example, so that can be helpful. Uh, but that's super great. Uh, Folk is actually pretty strong. 
uh, has access to the best knives in the game, uh, the base lard and pesh cards. One of those have one to range, the other one has more might. That can be helpful depending on what you're doing. Uh, for example, I think if you give him Dragon Foe and a one to range knife, he could probably kill all the dragons in 43. I guess generals, I don't give him a very high shot, uh, but he is very fast. I think he doubles aura as a base. So all those things can be very helpful. Again, not as useful as your actual trained units probably, but a pretty nice filler and surprisingly fun to use. He has Lethality, which is like a better version of Bane because Bane is basically I don't kill. And then Lethality is I do kill. And killing is pretty nice. Every mastery does that, don't get me wrong. I just wanted to make sure that like, you understand he's very distinct from Soth. <laughs> very, very distinct. Like, Folk is much better at fighting in this game. He was better at fighting in Path of Radiance 2. Uh, but even in this game, in part 4, he's much better. Um, Soth, obviously better in part 1, because Volk doesn't exist. Uh, then we have some dragons. Uh, the dragons all come for free in Endgame, like Kurth Naga, Enna, Nasir, and Gareth. None of them take up a slot in Endgame, which I think is very much worth mentioning, because it means you don't have to ditch someone else to bring them. Uh, mostly relevant for tier lists, but I just wanted to bring it up here. Kurthnaga has the least useful tide of them all, uh, Night Tide. In faster playthroughs, it's basically useless. I actually got a lot of utility out of it when playing casually, because a lot of the time you can use it for free without putting Kurth in danger, because Kurth himself doesn't have very good stats. In fact, he gets one rounded by a lot of things, or faces crit from a lot of things unless he's trained. That said, he's one of the most fun units to train. Uh, there's one map where the enemies just basically don't attack him at all, and you can just grind him up with Paragon and whatever you want, and make him very strong. Uh, you can also save your other people, and keep him safe that way. And just providing Night Tide alone can save people from death in certain um, areas, especially because of AoE attacks that can sometimes hit people like Micaiah. Uh, you can kind of help protect him from that. Uh, he also is helpful to put next to provoke units in the last couple maps, because those maps have a lot of one-to-range enemies that you don't want to gang up on one unit, so using provoke uh, can let them hit someone that you don't care about, or rather someone that doesn't take any damage from them, and uh, Kurthnaga can help you take no damage from them. So that is kind of funny. So I actually like Kurthnaga a lot more than I used to, uh, but training him is a high effort thing. <laughs> Let's just call it that. I like that phrase actually. It's a high effort thing. Uh, Anna, I don't think anyone is crazy enough to want to train Anna. I mean, you could if you wanted to, but the payoff is I think is even less than Kurthnaga. Uh, I think most people realize, yeah, Blood Tide is the way to go. Red Dragons have a skill, Blood Tide. You put them next to someone else, they get plus 5 strength, plus 5 skill. It's really helpful, increase your accuracy and your damage output, what more could you want? And it also has really good resistance, which makes her better in the last couple maps, but Gareth, who works the same way, can actually survive in endgame just fine, despite his complete lack of resistance. I made a whole waifu video about him, so they're pretty much the same unit in those maps. I don't really think they have a lot of utility before that, um, I mean, Gareth isn't around before the last two maps. Anna is, but she doesn't really do much unless you uh, specifically guard her. I guess you can do it. it. It can be helpful, but she's very fragile. Uh, if, especially untransformed, you could probably just transform her. <laughs> uh, but then she just doesn't have very good offense. I think it's the bigger problem here. I don't recommend using Anna to fight things. Just use Blood Tide when you can. Uh, sometimes it might be easier to just undeploy her. Renning is an endgame only character. I think it's the only character besides like Gifka and uh, Kanigas that you don't get before endgame. That is like optional deployment. And he kind of is not that great. He does have access to two effective weapons in endgame. The hammer for the generals in uh, the first map. And then the worm slayer for part uh, the, the third the third endgame map. Uh, in that case, he can be pretty nice. But again, like compared to it, it's probably not worth. I don't think a lot of people deployed him on the first playthrough. But... There's worse units. He needs a speed wing to double in hard mode, that's all I know, but he's not great. His bulk is kind of okay, though. Uh, I think his speed is the biggest problem he has, and then obviously resistance. Um, Nasir has another kind of tide that the dragons have. It's called White Pool. It boosts the unit's speed. Very helpful because Endgame has a couple of really fast enemies that you have to kill, and without Nasir, a lot of classes just straight up cannot double them. I think you need 38 attack speed to double, so um, someone like Nasala, Tabarn, Mia, Zyhark, those can probably double those, but someone like Ike, uh, Nephany, um, I think Alincia, I'm not sure about that one, uh, Nolan, Boyd, those cannot double without the help of Nazir, even if they cap speed, so having him next to them, very helpful. If you stack it along with uh, Blood Tide, uh, or even double Blood Tide, which you can also stack, then you can add a lot of damage with just the help of these dragons. Very, very nice to have. It also boosts magic by 5. I think that's less useful. I generally don't think magic units, offensive magic units, are very useful in endgame to begin with. As you might have seen by the, you know, overall lack of magical units to begin with. 
Um, so I don't count it for a whole lot, but I guess technically he increases the staff range of someone or the staff effectiveness. Uh, this guy, Spoiler Man, he joins on the last map, provided you fulfilled a couple of endgame requirements, a couple of uh, Easter egg things, and then he joins with the Ashura staff, uh, SS rank staff that heals everyone completely all the way. I think it restores status as well. I don't know about Biorhythm, I'm pretty sure it just restores status and HP. But that alone is helpful enough to where, you know, he's a helpful utility filler. And he also doesn't take up an endgame slot, so that's pretty cool. If you bless Balbarith with Pelias or um, Rexora with, like, Micaiah or something, then he also has a weapon to fight with. Uh, he has Mantle, so he cannot die. Um, that's pretty cool. Not dying is nice. But he's only around from one map, so not a whole lot of credit there for tier lists, but I can't recommend against using him. Then finally, we have the high effort category. These are units I don't recommend training for endgame or um, using full time, but if there's something that these units can do on these maps when you deploy them, or when they're auto-deployed, I recommend Mason using them. Uh, for example, Tormod and Muaram and Vika, they join in the Oliver Mansion and they don't fight very well. But there might be an enemy that needs finishing off, there might be a door that you need opening, there might be a chest that needs opening, um, there might be something else that they can do that you don't, that like, having them do it means now you doesn't have to bother, you can do, for, do something else with it. So in that sense they can function as like a thief or a dancer or something. So for those kind of things I recommend using these units. And that goes for all of them, if you find something that they can do, then make them do it, but generally it's not going to be worth it. I don't think it's worth like individually discussing why these units are not great in part 4, because I think I kind of alluded to it for most of them. I, I guess I'll go over them for a little bit. So Liana's mostly helpful in part 1, but she transfers to part 3 where she's on level that bad. Uh, Aaron, I tried my best to really use. I don't think it was worth it in my playthrough. I don't think he's very good. I think he's a high effort character uh, with not too much payoff in part 4. Uh, he just doesn't do enough damage. He doesn't level up high enough. It's hard to reach, reach tier 3 and the return is just not great. Um, Meg and Fiona are basically combat memes in part 1, it continues to be that way in part 3, and it continues to be that way in part 4, uh, but if you did like invest in them a lot, they could be good, I just can't call them good investments, <laughs> but their payoff is part 4. Uh, these guys don't have enough time to train up, and when they rejoin they're unleveled, um, the same goes for part 2 characters really, they just don't have enough availability to be really good for endgame. Uh, you might be surprised to see Joffrey here, but not Kieran, uh, if you haven't played the game. But Joffrey is not around in the first Tabarn map, and on the second one he joins. But that's a swamp map where he just doesn't do anything. So that makes him a not great candidate for even doing anything before the endgame. Then he's also not very good in the, in the endgame, because low speed cap and being a little bit on a level probably. So that's not great. Um, Heather's combat obviously not that great. Um, Brom doesn't have enough time to train. I guess no. Brom is around a lot. He's around the same as Stephanie. He just doesn't have very good combat. Period. Uh, Mordecai definitely not great at fighting, other than you know high strength and HP, but just really low speed kind of hurts him. Uh, Leith is a cat, um, kind of like Liar, slightly better. Not great. Uh, Astrid is a combat meme. Uh, Makalov takes a lot of training. Uh, this guy, I love him and everything, but I can't call him a good investment, but he's really fun to use. I recommend you give it a go. Uh, probably one of the most fun high effort characters. Halberd is a good class. Uh, Khalil, Meteor Chip is probably the best she can do in part 4. Uh, if you train her though, she could probably be good, but again, very low availability. Uh, the fact that she's not in 2-3 uh, with the rest of the Crimea Royal Knights just hurts her even further. So she's only around for 2 endgame, and then 3-9, and that's basically it until part 4. It's not a whole lot to train her, so that's why she's here. Soren I missed, I tried training in my Let's Play, wasn't really happy with how it turned out compared to how much I put into them, so that's why they're in here. Um, Liar, combat meme, Kiza, slightly less of a combat meme, and then Peleus, uh, if you fulfill the requirements, which is basically just don't kill the guy, uh, which is only available in second playthrough, then he can join you in 4-2, which is Tabarn's first map. But the annoying thing is he joins after the preparations, I think like turn 2 or something, it just appears on the map. And that sucks, because that means you can't bonus experience him in that map. It means you can't give him a new inventory if you wanted to. Um, it just sucks. And then 4-5, I guess you can do something, maybe. But um, he's still like on the level. He has like roughly Soren's bases. I, I said I've, did a lot. I've said this a lot in the past, but I just can't get over how Soren joins early on in part 3. And he joins early on in part 4, and he has the roughly the same base stats. That kind of stinks. So that's his big problem. And also, like I said earlier, magical units in uh, Radiant Dawn just generally nerfed, like, just not as good. Uh, very fragile, 
But once a range helps, hitting on resistance helps a bit. And the only dark magic user that you have in the game before, like Spoiler Man, so... If you really wanted to have one of every magic type, then he is someone you could use. But I don't recommend it. And also you can use staffs, I guess, that's also kind of nice. Uh, then we have Don't Forget Me, aka the Black Knight. He uh, He's not playable in part 4, let me just put it that way. But he's the only character that I had remaining, so I put him on here, just for fun. That's the whole list, that's how much I would recommend using each of these characters. I gotta stress that they're all viable in some sort of way, but the game wants you to use a certain ones more than others, so uh, I recommend sticking with that for the most part, and then you pick a couple from here that you really liked, and trying to use those as well, because turning one of these into a monster is a lot of fun and really done, and it's very easy to do with some patience, uh, but these, these are real juggernauts that you also want a couple of, because they're that much fun to use as well. That's the whole list, I hope you enjoyed uh, the Let's Play, all the character guides I made for this game, all the other content I made related to Raiding Dawn. It's a game that's very close to my heart, I forgot how much I loved it until I replayed it again. It is super fun, and uh, I'm definitely going to return to it in some way, shape or form on my channel, because I love it so much. That's all I gotta say, I'll see you guys next time. Uh, I don't know what games are left from the top of my head, uh, I think I did most of the ones that I like the most, that most people have played. But if I can come up with another game to make a guide for, I probably will. I'll see you around. Peace.